afternoon. Uh, so today we're going to discuss the chest pain differential diagnosis. Uh, before we enter into chest pain differential diagnosis, we're going to review basic understandings of the cardiovascular anatomy and physiology uh, to allow you to understand all the disease process that can produce chest pain. So basically concepts related to heart rate, we have tachycardia. Remember that tachycardia is no more than heart rate that is greater than 100. Uh, the normal heart rate uh, expected uh, by the SA node, which is the intrinsic pacemaker of the heart, is 60 to 100. When uh, cathecol means or the sympathetic nervous system is activated, the heart rate can be accelerated over 100. The contrary effect is bradycardia, when the heart rate is less than 60. This most likely is mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, most likely um, produced uh, already by either factors that augment the intraventricular septum or the uh, molar branches or Purkinje fibers that have more influence. Uh, for the parasympathetic nervous system um, in difference to the sympathetic nervous system. Now, in addition to that, we can uh, differentiate uh, by auscultation a certain pulses pattern that can be physiologic or pathologic. For example, we have uh, pulses paradoxus. Pulses paradoxus basically is an abnormal uh, uh, decrease in stroke volume uh, or systolic blood pressure or actually heart rate that is more than 10 millimeters of mercury. Normally when we breathe, the intrathoracic pressure uh, becomes more positive and uh, therefore, you know, compared to the atmospheric air, of course, and uh, this uh, basically impedes uh, briefly, of course, uh, or temporarily uh, preload to the right side of the heart and produces the, a paradoxical drop of uh, systolic blood pressure as well as heart rate but no more than 10 millimeters of mercury compared to the expiratory phase. When the uh, systolic blood pressure or the heart rate during inspiration uh, drops more than 10 millimeters of mercury we are basically dealing, dealing with a disease that is impeding preload. If you recall, when we're trying to depict the heart, okay, basically the preload is the amount of blood that goes into the right atrium via superior vena cava or inferior vena cava. So what factors can impede preload? Well, first of all, uh, of course, if the patient has any restriction at the level of the pericardium that is no more than the layer that surrounds the heart, that can impede preload. Uh, for example, if you have any uh, cardiac tamponade that uh, will not allow the proper uh, relaxation of the right side of the heart, that will impede a preload. So pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, as well as restricted cardiomyopathy on disease processes that will not allow a proper uh, relaxation of the right side of the heart, impeding blood coming from the lower extremities, abdomen, as well as the head and the neck via a preload or via superior and inferior vena cava. In addition, um, sorry the back and forth, what else can impede a, um, a proper preload? Not only disease processes that are related to the heart, but let's talk about non-cardiovascular conditions such as pulmonary conditions. Anything that increases pressure at the level of the, size, the right side of the heart can decrease preload. For example, you know that the lung is connected to the right ventricle via the uh, pulmonary artery. So what about if we have a patient with a pulmonary embolism 
that by increasing pressure at the level of the lung, that pressure regurgitates back into the right ventricle, increasing the end-diastolic volume of the right ventricle and therefore pressure, and that impedes preload into the right side of the heart. Other example could be pulmonary fibrosis. Another example could be just as simple as asthma. So pulsus paradoxus is not pathognomonic for pericarditis or cardiac tamponade. It could also be present in disease process non-related to cardiovascular condition. Another um, type of pulse is called uh, pulsus alternance. Basically, it's no more than the alternation between uh, a very weak pulse and a very strong pulse. So if we go and uh, depict the uh, graph um, that the blood exerts at the level of the capillary, uh, producing not only uh, blood pressure but also heart rate, basically what happens is that normally we have this type of pulse. So when it becomes a weaker in one phase and stronger in another phase, could be interpreted as either by frisions or alternance. And pulses alternance, again, alternates weak and strong pulse, and that could be an indication of left ventricular failure. And the left ventricular failure that can also produce a biphasic pulse could be related to disease process that impede cardiac output. You know, for example, that if we have a patient with aortic stenosis, the amount of blood that will be ejected as cardiac output into the systemic circulation will be decreased. So any disease process that impedes cardiac output can give you an alternation of weak and strong pulse, which could be uh, very interrelated both as alternance or by phasic or by frigens. Another condition that can do that could be left ventricular heart failure because systolic heart failure or left ventricular heart failure also decreases cardiac output by impeding an amount of blood coming out through systole to the tissue. Another condition that can do that will be uh, asymmetric hypertrophy of the septum, I'm sorry, of the septum which is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So when the patients have an asymmetric hypertrophy of the septum, that will occlude the passage of blood through the aorta. And even if the aortic valve is not stenotic, the amount of blood flow going through the aorta will be diminished, diminishing cardiac output. So any disease process, again, that decreases cardiac output can give you an alternate alternation of a weak and strong pulse in different phases, therefore producing a biphasic uh, or alternating pulse. And again, that is highly prevalent in patients that have left ventricular heart failure produced by either sustained hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension, patients that have aortic stenosis, patients that could have cardiomyopathy, in this case will be hypertrophic type. Now, going through other um, assessment uh, that we can do for patients that have cardiovascular conditions would be jugular vein pressure. And uh, in this case, we can actually palpate the liver and see how much hepatojugular reflux the patient has. Again, if you go back to the pathophysiology and we recall what's called right-sided heart failure, patients with uh, right-sided heart failure, since the amount of blood that is coming through the right atrium is either impeded because the patient has tricuspid recurge or tricuspid stenosis, we're gonna go through the valvulopathies in a second, or there is dilation or hypertrophy of the right ventricle, the amount of preload that tries to go in is difficult. So 
that produce, for example, if I have a tricuspid stenosis, the amount of blood that is supposed to pass through preload into the right ventricle is diminished. Therefore, there is a regurgitant amount of volume going back into the entrances, which is the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. So if I have a regurgitant amount of volume going back into the superior vena cava, the patient's gonna have signs and symptoms of confusion up to the point of seizures and lethargy and coma. Patients are gonna have jugular vein distension and if it regurgitates back into the inferior vena cava, since the inferior vena cava gets the supply of blood coming from the abdomen and all the organs that we have in the splactic circulation, as well as the lower extremities, the patients would have ascites, the patients would have hepatosplechnomegaly, as well as lower extremity edema. So just by assessing the liver and see if the patient has any type of hepatojugular reflux or if we actually assess the uh, distension or pulsation indirectly of the carotid artery into the jugular vein, we can determine if the patient has a possibility of having right sided heart failure or right ventricular failure. Another indirect assessment that we can do is listening to the lungs. Patients with left sided heart failure tend to have regurgitated amount of blood coming from the left ventricle into the left atrium and therefore since we do have the pulmonary veins connected to the left atrium, the amount of blood or volume that it will be regurgitated back into the lung will be high, therefore the patients would have lung crackles or rails being audible by a stethoscope. Now, other assessment that we can do on a patient, just at a glance, for example, if you look at a patient that has uh, um, anteposterior um, a diameter of the chest uh, increased, we can determine that this patient has any type of pulmonary condition that is producing hyperinflation. For example, patients with chronic asthma, patients with COPD, they tend to have long AP diameter, not only visible in a chest x-ray, but as well, you can see it when the patients undress. Patients with Marfan syndrome, which is no more than an auto -re autosomic recessive condition of collagen um, that basically autoantibodies attack the uh, collagen, these patients tend to have also a very long stature and an AP diameter as well is very uh, elongated, as well as, for example, patients with Turner syndrome, that their high risk for cardiomyopathies and valvulopathies, they tend to have a very short stature. Um, and in addition to that, not only this type of patients, if you now observe the skin of the patient, uh, patients, for example, with uh, steroid depending uh, due to either COPD or pulmonary fibrosis or any autoimmune condition, that the patients are placed on a, a, a long-term prednisone, you can uh, see how the skin is so fragile, it's kind, kind of onion-like uh, skin, they have uh, easy fragility, they uh, uh, have, tend to have uh, uh, echemoses, um, uh, platelets uh, de be decreased, and they have uh, easy gum uh, bleeding as well. So in addition, you can determine if the patient, for example, has any type of anemic condition, just looking at a uh, pallor. Pallor is also an indication that there is improper cardiac output, so the patients would have uh, not only cold skin, but also pallor uh, being visible. Uh, cyanosis, for example, is another example uh, that not only can give you um, uh, acrocyanosis, basically distal uh, cyanosis, patients that have any type of uh, uh, either chronic hypoxemia uh, or patients that have any type of congenital heart disease can, uh, um, just by looking at the skin, 
uh, could be an indicative factor that the patient is going through chronic hypoxia, either pulmonary or cardiac related. Another factor that you can look at when you are assessing a patient, if you see that the patient has uh, uh, um, uh, engorged uh, or um, increased uh, distal diameter of the uh, fingers, or um, they also tend to have a widening of the nail plate, uh, that's also an indication of uh, chronic hypoxia even though, of course, it could be present in patients that have anemia, because patients that have chronic anemia, they tend to have chronic hypoxia as well. So again, look at everything. It's not only uh, assessing and auscultating the heart, but look at the patient's skin, look at the patient's chest wall appearance, uh, because the, the chest wall appearance can also give you an idea of the limitations that the patients might have to get a good amount of uh, uh, tidal volume or good uh, um, uh, long volume to be able to oxygenate the rest of the tissue. Look at the way the patient is breathing. If the patient has tachypnea, if the patient has any type of paradoxical breathing, normally when we breathe, the diaphragm goes down and there is expansion of the chest wall and the ribs flatten, they become more horizontal. When the patients are basically having abdominal breathing, that's an indication of distress, which could be pulmonary related or it could be actually cardiac associated factor. Now let's look at as well, uh, if the patient is connected to the monitor or we have a 12 lead EKG uh, baseline of the patient, we can compare, look at the rhythm of the patient, many cardiovascular conditions can give you alterations of rhythm, either if it's the bradyarrhythmia, giving the patients a bradycardia, a sinus bradycardia, or if the patient has any type of uh, atrioventricular block or bundle branch block. In addition, look at if the patient is under distress, uh, you can determine uh, based on the cardiac rhythm, patients tend to go mostly into tachyarrhythmia, again from sinus tachycardia to supraventricular tachycardia or irregular rhythms such as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. We just uh, covered uh, heart sounds in the prior class, so remember that S1 in the cardiac cycle is no more than the closure of the atrioventricular valves, S2 is no more than the closure of the semilunar valve, S3 is a representation of stretching or dilation uh, or um, basically no more than um, expansion of the ventricular fibers, which it is highly interpreted as uh, patients that have volume overload state, but think about S3 as well as having any type of disease that can stretch the ventricular fibers. Again, if we come here, and we explained, again, the heart. Yes, if the patient has a volume of a low state, which there's a major increase of preload, that the patient, in this case, uh, the organ, the heart, cannot handle appropriately, either right ventricular heart failure producing ascites, lower extremity edema, JVD, or patients that have left ventricular heart failure producing pulmonary edema, this state of overload will stretch the ventricular fibers. But what about pulmonary conditions? Again, if I explain disease process that can increase the pressure at the level of the lung, this pressure can regurgitate back into the right ventricle, producing acute dilation of the right ventricular fibers, which is no more called core pulmonal. And core pulmonal is also uh, um, a disease process that can give you an S3. Well, S3 is also physiologically present. Think about these, um, I'm sorry, physiological processes or 
population, meaning patient type of population, that can give you an overload state physiologically. Pregnancy is one. If the patient is pregnant, they do have a normal physiological hypervolemia, and therefore patients with pregnancy can have an S3 without having any type of disease process. S3 can also be present in patients that have, due to volume of distribution and high volume uh, level compared to tissue, muscle mass uh, versus fat. For example, pediatric patient, elderly patient, uh, without having any type of cardiovascular condition, can have a physiological S3 present without having any type of disease process. We should have already covered that in prior uh, classes as well. Now, going back to S1 and S2, um, remember that normally the blood comes in into the right atrium by superior and inferior vena cava. The heart is supposed to relax in diastole to be able to receive the blood. So once the pressure at the level of the right atrium increases, that pushes open the tricuspid valve, allowing blood to go into the right ventricle, therefore increasing pressure in the right ventricle. Once the pressure in the right ventricle is increased, that pushes close the tricuspid valve and therefore opens the semilunar valve. So the same pathway or the same mechanism that happens in the right side of the heart happens in the left side of the heart seconds earlier than the right being the left side a high pressure system compared to the right. So therefore closure of the tricuspid and mitral valve that happens simultaneously, of course the mitral a little bit earlier than the right that produces a sound, and that sound is called S1. When the blood passes through the pulmonary artery by systole, and the blood also passes through the aorta from the left ventricle by systole, once the blood goes into the systemic circulation or goes to the lung to be oxygenated, the closure of the semilunar valve, aortic and pulmonic, happening seconds earlier in the aortic valve since the left side of the heart is a high pressure system compared to the right. Therefore, the closure of this semilunar valve produces another physiological sound, which is called S2. Again, S3 could be physiologic or pathologic and is produced by a distension, stretching, or tension of the ventricular fibers most likely produced by volume overload state, either physiological stage of volume overload or pathological diseases that can produce volume overload. And examples of that are, of course, CHF, but other examples that can produce that could be any disease that can give you an asarca or any disease that can give you pulmonary edema, uh, such as liver cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, any type of glomerulonephritis, etc. Now, S4, on the contrary, S4 is produced by high pressure. And high pressure at the level of the ventricles most likely is produced by either hypertension or any valvulopathies or any cardiomyopathy that increases pressure at the level of the uh, ventricles. And this could include from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to uh, aortic stenosis or uh, pulmonary stenosis. So S4 is always pathological. Now, we discussed about the split. Splitting mean that the left side of the heart, since it's a higher pressure system compared to the right, every single physiological mechanism or cardiac conduction system or mechanics of the valve happens seconds earlier in the left side compared to the right. So if we're going to discuss about the closure of the mitral compared to the tricuspid, there's a closure milliseconds earlier of the mitral compared to the tricuspid. 
The same thing happens with aortic versus pulmonic. Now, it shouldn't happen backwards. When the tricuspid valve closes before the mitral, that means that there's a high pressure system, higher compared to the left, left side of the heart, which is not physiologic. So think about the disease process that could be increasing the pressure at the level of the right side of the heart. From an acute pulmonary embolism to chronic conditions at the level of the lung, pulmonary fibrosis, COPD, and any disease process that can give you right ventricular uh, blocks, as well as, uh, for example, tricuspid stenosis or right ventricular failure. That doesn't mean that disease process in the left side of the heart can produce this because you remember that left side of heart failure happens before right side of the heart. So any disease process that can give you high pressure system in the left consequently will give you right pressure in the right side of the heart, which could be higher pressures compared to the left later on as a complication. Now, let's continue talking about uh, palpation. Remember that you have to do auscultation, palpation, precaution. Um, first, actually, is inspection. So you have to inspect the person. We looked at the, the, the thoracic cage. We looked at the JVD. We look at the skin. So that will be basically inspection. Uh, you could also look in the chest wall in patients that are very, very skinny to see if there's a major high pulsation of the aorta, in this case, abdominal, uh, that could be visible in patients that have uh, a very uh, uh, a small fat uh, content and, you know, skinny persons, or patients that do have any type of uh, aneurysm in the abdominal aorta. So that could be uh, one of the inspections uh, process that we can do. Another one that we can see is that at the level of the apex, patients can have a very high pulsation or deviated pulsation that could indicate us that there is a deviation of the apex, which is indicative of left ventricular hypertrophy. So then after that, we do auscultation, um, and we already went through the process of auscultation. Um, then we do palpation. Um, we can actually, again, palpate uh, the apex of the heart uh, the same way as we try to look for pulsations. So we palpate the uh, apex of the heart, and the apex of the heart is not at the fifth intercostal space left uh, um, uh, um, midclavicular line or nipple line. Uh, it's highly indicative that the patient has left ventricular uh, hypertrophy and uh, basically if it's in the sixth, seventh, or any other space, or if it's deviated uh, inferiorly as well. We can also determine that by looking to see if instead of the uh, apical impulse or the uh, um, pulsation of the apex is not located in the fifth intercostal space, but it is located more medially or to the right, which is indicative of right ventricular uh, hypertrophy as well. We can also uh, palpate to see if we feel any type of thrill, which the thrills are highly indicative of high pressure, most likely in stenotic valves. Uh, we can palpate the pulse of the patient to see if it's regular or irregular, to see if it has any type of biphasic tone. Uh, remember to uh, be able to understand if the patient has any type of uh, a stenosis of the aortic valve that could impede our cardiac output. We talked already about how you can do liver palpation. Um, the patients, uh, there's many, many disease processes that can give you hepatomegaly, uh, but one of the m disease processes that can give you uh, increased size of the liver is uh, right side of heart failure. Normally, the liver is not palpated, not even during deep inspiration. Uh, so when you're able to palpate uh, more than two centimeters below the costal margin, the liver, uh, not only you're uh, determining that there is hepatomegaly, that could be an indication of engorgement of the liver due to right side of heart failure, 
but at the same time you could palpate the consistency and the borders to see the regular smooth, which is normal, and soft compared to nodular or irregular in patients that have liver cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, we can also uh, try to look at the JBD to see if there's any type of hepatojugular reflux, which is also an indication of right ventricular heart failure. Unfortunately, percussion of the heart is uh, very limited since, uh, for example, in the women we have the breast and we also have uh, muscle tissue superimposed and we have ribs. Uh, the best uh, precaution that we can do is when we do pulmonary uh, to be able to determine if there is dullness to precaution uh, to uh, predict that there is a possibility of uh, pleural refusion, which is volume of low state present in patients that have left ventricular heart failure or systolic heart failure. So laboratory wise, we can also look at uh, cardiac troponins. For example, if we're thinking that now the patient comes in with chest pain, most likely retrosternal, pressure like related, with migration or not, uh, to the jaw, to the neck, to the shoulder or to the interscapular area, um, how do we know that we are in the presence of an acute coronary syndrome? In this case, ischemic type, angina pectoris versus myocardial infarction. So basically, you have to do cardiac enzymes. And when we draw cardiac enzymes, so basically this graph is determining the peak onset or appearance and duration of all the cardiac enzymes. For example, we look here, uh, myoglobin, that is early in appearance, has a peak more or less two hours, but is highly insensitive because uh, the enzyme myoglobin could be released due to by any damage of a muscle, either a smooth muscle or skeletal muscle. Another example could be related to, for example, CK or CKMB that even though is uh, CKMB is more specific for heart compared to myoglobin and compared to CK, you can see that the peak effect could take from like 10, 15 hours all the way to 24 hours. So, but again, myoglobin, CK, CK and B are sensitive, but they're not specific for myocardial infarction. For that, we should do troponin and most commonly troponin I, which is highly specific for myocardial infarction, which the peak time is 12 hours, as you can see. Even though that this is basically one of the major onset of action before 20 hours and could last up to uh, 24 hours, giving a plateau before it gets eliminated, okay? Now let's talk about um, bubbleopathies and uh, let's understand first the basics before we go into detail uh, classifying the characteristics of the murmur. So again, first of all, you need to understand the cardiac cycle to be able to determine if the Bubbleopathies of the patients are systolic versus diastolic. And if you understand the cardiac cycle, it's really easy to understand. And then after that, you could remember uh, the quality of the uh, murmurs, okay? So first of all, let's start with the right side of the heart. Remember again that the blood goes into the right atrium. When the high pressure increases at the level of the right atrium, the tricuspid valves open and the tricuspid valves open in diastole to be able to allow the blood to pass from the right atrium into the right ventricle. So therefore, if you are not opening the tricuspid valve properly, it's because you have a stenosis. So a stenotic tricuspid valve or any tricuspid stenosis will produce a diastolic murmur because the valve is supposed to be opening in diastole and it's not happening properly. So again, tricuspid stenosis would give you a diastolic murmur. Then now, 
the blood passes into the right ventricle properly, but the tricuspid valve is supposed to be closed in systole to allow the pulmonary artery to open to pass the blood non-oxygenated into the lungs to be oxygenated. If at any point the tricuspid valve does not close properly in systole, that produces a prolapse or produces a regurgitation into the right atrium and therefore tricuspid regurgitation will produce a systolic murmur. Okay? So now let's continue with the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery is supposed to be open in systole to allow the blood to be ejected into the lung to be oxygenated. If at any point the, the, the pulmonary valve has any type of stenosis, the murmur that produces a pulmonary stenosis will be a systolic murmur. So pulmonary stenosis would have a systolic murmur. Another uh, explanation, uh, after the um, blood goes into the lung to be oxygenated, it's supposed to return back into the left atrium, already oxygenated, and into the left atrium. So what happens if at any point, since the pulmonary artery is supposed to be closed in diastole to allow blood coming from the lung to go into the left atrium and therefore into the left ventricle, the pulmonary valve doesn't close properly in diastole, then a pulmonary regurgitation will happen. So pulmonary regurgitation happens in diastole and therefore you would have a diastolic murmur. Continuing with the left side of the heart, once the blood is in the left atrium by the pulmonary veins, that increases the pressure at the level of the left atrium, allowing the mitral valve to open by difference in pressure gradient. So if the mitral valve is not opening properly during diastole because it has a stenosis, mitral stenosis produces a diastolic murmur. Then once the blood passes into the left ventricle, it's supposed to be ejected through the aorta, but before that, before the aortic valve opens in systole, the mitral valve is supposed to be closed during systole. If at any point there is a defect of closure due to prolapse or due to regurgitation, the patients would have a systolic murmur. So mitral regurg would give you a systolic murmur. Same thing happens in the aorta. Blood is supposed to pass through the aorta to the systemic circulation to oxygenate the tissue. If the patient at any point in systole is unable to expel the blood from the left ventricle into the aorta because the patients have an aortic stenosis, then the murmur for aortic stenosis is going to be systolic. And for aortic regurgitation, once the blood is spelled into the systemic circulation, if the aortic valve doesn't close properly to restart a new cycle, then in diastole, there is regurgitant blood back into the left ventricle producing a diastolic murmur. Okay? So at least we know based on the cardiac cycle, if we do have an aortic stenosis, which type of murmur do we have? If we have any type of valvulopathy, which type of murmur are we expecting? Either systolic or diastolic. Then after that, you need to remember your anatomic locations. In the second intercostal space, right sternal order, border, I'm sorry, you have the aortic valve. In the second intercostal space to the left sternal border, you have the pulmonic. In the third intercostal space, you have the herb spine. In the third to fourth intercostal space, you have the tricuspid valve. 
In the fifth intercostal space, you have the mitral valve. So no is systolic and diastolic. Knowing the diastolic, I'm sorry, the anatomic location of the valve, you could at least determine the most probable valvulopathy that the patients would have. After that, now let's start going through the characteristics of the, uh, um, or the quality of the murmur. Well, again, going through, which I'm not gonna go through the diagram again, if you have a patient with aortic stenosis, which the aortic valve or sclerosis, if you have a patient with any type of structure not allowing the valve to open properly in systole, you're gonna have, of course, a systolic murmur that, of course, is actually, uh, quality is basically worsens um, with, as, as you increase pressure, for example, if you do squatting, uh, decreases with movement, so you could tell the patient, uh, stop breathing, so you could hear the quality, the, the actual faces of the, of the murmur, to uh, increase pressure by squatting, and uh, also by coughing, uh, if it accentuates the uh, murmur or not, okay? Aortic stenosis as well, quality type is a high pitch murmur. So when you're auscultating, when you're using your stethoscope, you have two parts of the stethoscope, many of them. You have a diaphragm, which is the big area, and you have the bell, which is the very small area in the back. Okay, so you need to understand that diaphragm is used to uh, auscultate high pitch sound, and the bell is to auscultate low pitch sound. Uh, some stethoscopes have the bell integrated into it, so basically to be able to use the bell, you uh, basically place the uh, diaphragm of the stethoscope very lightly on top of the chest, do not apply any type of pressure, uh, and that would, you, would, you will be using the bell in that condition. Once you press down firmly, then you will be using the diaphragm. But again, diaphragm high pitch sounds, uh, 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 bell low pitch sound. So the murmur of aortic stenosis is high pitch, it's diamond shape, it tends to be crescendo, decrescendo, but again, if you don't remember the quality of the murmur, at least you will predict very highly which type of murmur this patient have, depending on the cardiac cycle, if it's systolic, if it's diastolic, where should hurt the best based on anatomic location, second intercostal space, uh, uh, right sternal border or left sternal border, etc. Okay? So it tends to radiate to the neck and the carotid arteries. And uh, of course, if you have a patient with aortic stenosis that uh, will produce a systolic heart failure uh, with decreased cardiac output that will uh, decrease the uh, intensity of the uh, murmur in this case. Another condition that we already kind of reviewed already is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they tend to have an asymmetric septum and that tends to occlude uh, the aortic valve producing aortic stenosis. Remember, aortic stenosis is a high pressure valvulopathy because it's not allowing the blood to uh, 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 flow out or, or be expelled out properly uh, to the tissue. Therefore, produces a high ventricular pressure and most commonly what is present is an S4 sound. Now, let's talk about the signs and symptoms of aortic stenosis that could also be present in patients that have uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Very easy to understand. Uh, they tend to have a triad. If you have any obstruction to the outlet of the aortic valve through systole, so if the cardiac output is compromised, what symptoms would the patient have that mean tissue hypoperfusion? So when you do not perfuse properly the tissues, and this includes the brain, patients would have, first of all, a syncope episode. So syncope is a sign, is a symptom 
that is related to tissue hyperperfusion of any kind. Another way of representing uh, tissue hyperperfusion when the uh, uh, cell it goes through anaerobic metabolism because it's hypooxygenated or non-oxygenated produces lactic acid and lactic acid produces pain. It's the byproduct of the anaerobic metabolism. So lactic acidosis produced by tissue hyperperfusion produces chest pain. So chest pain is another symptom of uh, aortic stenosis as well as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because that impedes tissue hyperperfusion. And another one, the patient to be able to compensate, they will start having tachypnea. So shortness of breath, syncope, and chest pain is the most common triad present in patients that have aortic stenosis as well as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is produced by tissue hyperperfusion. So again, that's the reason why there's no need to memorize. So you have chest pain that is very similar to acute coronary syndrome. You have syncope that, of course, the more you have exertion, any type of activity, you consume more oxygen, so you're more prone to syncope or faint. You could have, of course, due to tissue hyperperfusion, uh, hypoxemia is one of the H's of the ACLS algorithm that gives you cardiac arrhythmias. Most of the time, it's tachyarrhythmias, while the patients will present up to the point of fatal arrhythmias that the patients can have a sudden death, which is the most common presentation of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in uh, adolescents. Okay? And of course, because there's no proper ejection, there's no proper cardiac output, uh, the heart tries to compensate and through auto regulatory response increases um, fiber hyperproliferation and therefore leventricular hypertrophy. Now, going through mitral regurgitation, uh, if you now go back to the scheme, in mitral regurgitation, that doesn't mean that because you have mitral regurgitation, you have no affected cardiac output, but just pay attention very briefly. If you have a blood coming down through the left ventricle properly, but the mitral valve is supposed to be closed in systole and doesn't close properly, what happens is that blood goes back from the left ventricle, leaking through the mitral valve, and therefore increases the amount of volume in the left ventricle, and I'm sorry, in the left atrium, as well as pressure. Now the most common presentation to mitral valvulopathy is either stenosis or regurgitation because of this high volume and high pressure, most commonly what they do have is pressure and volume regurgitating back into the lung, producing pulmonary edema, crackles, and therefore shortness of breath. But this shortness of breath and chest pain or syncope that the patient can have less likely is related to cardiac output being compromised. Most commonly is due to volume overload at the level of the lung due to high volume, high pressure regurgitating back into the lung. Of course, the more volume that goes regurgitating back into the left atrium, the less volume is present in the left ventricle, the less volume goes into the tissue, but again, that is the least common of the scenarios for them, unless there's a critical bubbleopathy at the level of the mitral valve. okay? So again, as I said, uh, mitral regurgitation could happen due to, or prolapse could happen for any reasons. Uh, you could either have, for example, rheumatic diseases that uh, the, the valve becomes fibrotic, or maybe uh, it's congenital, or maybe the patient has a rupture of the papillary muscles that basically anchor the uh, valve, and one of the, one of the papillary muscles are rupture, uh, and that produces uh, mitral regurg. Uh, another could be, for example, patients that have any type of congenital uh, heart disease that uh, basically can produce, for example, pain in 
uh, doctors arteriosos, or patients having any type of acute coronary syndrome, such as uh, 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 MI, either posterior or inferior wall MI, that can also produce uh, mitral regurgitation, and also can occur in patients that have any type of MI, anterior, lateral, posterior, inferior, but the most common are inferior, posterior, and lateral. Now again, going back through the symptoms, again, what do the patient have the most? What the patients have the most in mitral valve volopathies is the amount of volume and pressure regurgitating back into the left atrium, therefore producing dyspnea due to volume overload in the lung, producing crackles, uh, and therefore producing shortness of breath. Regurgitation and prolast are very, very highly interrelated. Now, how uh, mitral as well as tricuspid valvulopathies tend to produce atrial fibrillation. Again, looking here, if you have any tricuspid or mitral valve, either stenosis or regurgitation, since the amount of blood in the right atrium or left atrium is really high, as well as pressure, what do you have in the atrium? You have the SA node. Remember that the SA node is here and also sends signals into the left atrium, even more if you have any type of ectopic foci that is sending stimuli to the atrioventricular uh, uh, junction. So any disease process that increases pressure and volume at the level of the right or left atrium will alter cardiac conduction and electricity at the level of the SA node, and that can produce tachyarrhythmia from a sinus tachycardia to atrial fibrillation to atrial flutter. That doesn't happen when you have a ventricular anomaly. So, that patients that have mitral regurgitation eventually, because the left side of the heart fails, the right side of the heart consequently fails, yes, but it has to be a very advanced disease. So again, for mitral regurgitation, the most common symptoms are related to pulmonary congestion, do shortness of breath, uh, uh, pulmonary edema, crackles uh, be present, okay? Now, the murmur tends to uh, radiate mostly to the axilla compared to the neck and the carotids in patients that have aortic stenosis. Uh, that also can happen, mitral regurgitation, that also can happen when patients have any type of acute or chronic pulmonary disease. Remember, whenever you have a pulmonary condition here that the pressure increases, not only goes uh, the pressure into the right uh, a ventricle via the pulmonary artery, but the lungs are also connected to the pulmonary veins. So pressure also increases at the level of the pulmonary vein, regurgitating back into the left atrium and can produce mitral stenosis as well as mitral regurgitation. Okay? So very similar uh, mitral prolapse. So now let's go through the diastolic murmurs. Uh, which are either physiologic or pathologic. Remember, S1 is physiologic, closure of the AV valve. S2 is physiologic, closure of the semilunals. S3 could be physiologic or pathologic, most likely determined by a volume overload uh, uh, state, uh, either physiologic, such as pregnancy, or pathologic, such as CHF. And it could also be present in any disease process that acutely or chronic stretches the ventricular fibers for example, pulmonary embolism or COPD, pulmonary fibrosis. So as you could see, S1 is the closure of the atrioventricular valve, and as soon as the atrioventricular valve closed, systole starts. That's the reason why ventricular sister, systole is mediated in an EKG by a QRS complex. So S2 happens after S2, after S1, I'm sorry. Uh, of course, common sense. And S2 is no more than the closure of the semilunar valve, therefore means that the tricuspid and mitral valves are opening to start diastole. So S2 marks diastolic function or relaxation of the heart or repolarization. 
S3 is after S2, which could be present physiological, but before S4. S4 is always, always, always pathological, and it's a diastolic murmur that is highly present in high pressure uh, disease process. So this is what I just explained. It could be completely physiological in children, in uh, patients that are pregnant women, in patients that have a normal physiological high volume, either because of hypervolemia of pregnancy or because of volume of distribution. Mitrostenosis, again, uh, very uh, similar to mitral regurgitation. Let me explain the process. So you have a patient with mitral stenosis. So once the blood comes from the lung, it's supposed to pass into the left ventricle, but the mitral valve is completely stenotic or at any degree. So if, for example, 80% of the blood is supposed to pass into the left ventricle to be ejected to the systemic circulation and only 40% passes, that means that 40% regurgitates back into the left atrium, increasing volume and pressure at the level of the left atrium, and therefore regurgitates back into the lung, producing exactly the same symptoms, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, and crackles, okay? So that disease process can also give you atrial fibrillation because it will alter the conduction electricity of the heart at the level of the left atrium. So what can produce stenosis? Of course, it could be one of the most common disease process, which is rheumato uh, um, rheumat rheumatic fever. Uh, another condition, any fibrotic state, the patient has scleroderma, lupus, uh, can also stiffening or uh, uh, thickening the uh, uh, valves. Uh, tumors can do that, any type of thrombi, can do that, so basically prevents the uh, mitral valve to open properly in diastole. And that produces, as I, as I said, most commonly pulmonary congestion, producing shortness of breath, producing pulmonary edema, producing crackles. That of course, eventually the left side of the heart fails, failing the right, producing right side of heart failure, yes, but it's less common. Uh, that that could happen unless the patients have severe uh, stages of the disease. Therefore, in severe stages of the disease, because the amount of blood that passes into the left ventricle is diminished, eventually the cardiac output and stroke volume will be compromised. But again, the most common symptoms in mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation are highly uh, affecting the lung, giving you pulmonary edema, shortness of breath, and crackle. This is just a representation of mitral stenosis. So how the murmur is in mitral stenosis, remember the mitral valve is supposed to be open in diastole and it's narrow, so it is a diastolic murmur. And because the mitral valve is located in the fifth intercostal space at the apex midclavicular line, it's located at the level of the apex. Uh, it's rhombo uh, type, it has basically two faces, uh, one phase is an opening snap due to high pressure. It has a decrescendo phase, but again, always, always diastolic. Another phase is based on the uh, track, the, the, the contraction, the, the, the try to eject the remnant blood that is stressing on the left uh, atrium, and that produces a high turbulence at the level of the left atrium that can give you atrial fibrillation as a complication. Again. The most common symptoms are related to pulmonary congestion, but when the stages of the disease are severe, of course it compromises the cardiac output. But cardiac output decrease is highly prevalent in aortic stenosis and regurgitation patients. Um, so, in addition, uh, any disease process that gives you high pressure at the level of the lung uh, due to mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation uh, 
due to pulmonary congestion will increase the pressure at the level of the capillaries producing an apoplexy and that produces rupture of the pulmonary vessels and the patients can have hemoptysis. The laryngeal nerve that passes through that area can also be compromised due to the high pressure at the level of the left atrium. So sometimes patients do have hoarseness associated. Uh, we already explained tricuspid stenosis and the mechanisms. Most likely, these patients tend to have because of regurgitant blood back into the jugular vein, into the abdomen, into the lower extremities. They tend to have signs and symptoms of right ventricular heart failure, which is jugular vein distension, ascites, spatosplecnomegaly, and lower extremity edema. Now, in addition to that, to be able to compensate, of course, the uh, right atrium and the right ventricles tends to be hypertrophied. That can also give you atrial fibrillation as one of the major complications. The type of murmur is low pitch, is rumbling, again, is diastolic. Why? Because tricuspid valve is supposed to be open in diastole and is closed due to fibrotic tissue. And at the level of the EKG, the atrium contraction is represented by P wave, so it's atrial systole. So that's the reason why either in mitral stenosis or tricuspid stenosis, you tend to have what's called pulmonary P, which is a high peak P wave. Aortic regurg, now going back into um, the scheme the diagram. It will represent the aortic valve. Once the blood is ejected through the aorta, the, aort the aortic valve is supposed to be closed in diastole, and if it doesn't close properly, there's a small amount of blood that is regurgitating back into the left ventricle, producing high pressure here, accumulated in the, next, in the next cycle. And of course, it's gonna compromise your cardiac output, but at the same time, tricuspid uh, uh, regurgitation can give you a high degree of mitral regurg as well. Due to the accumulation of blood volume and pressure at the level of the left ventricle in every cycle. So tricuspid stenosis is associated with signs and symptoms of cardiac output being compromised as well as when it's severe, that will give you mitral regurg and the signs and symptoms of uh, mitral regurg, which is pulmonary edema, crackles, and shortness of breath. So the type uh, um, of murmur, of course, uh, tends to be uh, mostly high pitch, it's blowing, it's decrescendo in nature, it's diastolic because the aortic valve is supposed to be closed in diastole, and um, again, any type of valvulopathy tends to be completely asymptomatic in mild degree uh, stages. Uh, until the patient has moderate to severe stages is when the patient starts having all the symptoms that we have described. Again, in aortic regurgitation, you tend to have signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output as well as orthopnea, shortness of breath, and crackles, pulmonary edema, uh, chest pain, so combination of the same symptoms that produces aortic stenosis with the symptoms of mitral regurgitation. So this is basically an anatomic representation and now uh, talking about the quality of the murmur for aortic regurg, it's soft, it's high pitch, it's diastolic, it's decreased in nature. So remember that aortic valve it tends to be in the second uh, intercostal space, right sternal border, it tends to radiate uh, into the apex as well. So it goes from the third herbs point into the apex. So that's basically the radiation. But the base anatomic location is second intercostal space, right sternal border, radiating into the herbs point and into the apex. And of course, is um, uh, mostly a uh, pronouncing expiration when the patient is sitting up and leaning forward. So you could do those maneuvers to the patient. Now, what else can compromise uh, um, the cardiac function? Uh, for example, if we go back and uh, refresh the uh, congenital anomalies of the heart, uh, we do have uh, septal, uh, atrial and uh, ventricular septal defect. 
Normally, the heart has four cavities, and at birth, with the first cry, the foramen oval should be closed, right? And a couple of weeks after, uh, the um, doctor's arteriosis, uh, by the high levels of, uh, um, I'm sorry, by the low levels of prostaglandin. So therefore, um, if there is any type of communication between the atrium or the ventricle, remember that normally the blood goes into the right atrium, is completely non-oxygenated, passes into the right ventricle, completely non-oxygenated before it goes to the lung. The beauty of these conditions, even though uh, the patients have a mix, mix, mixture of blood, oxygenated and non-oxygenated, is that once the blood goes into the lung to be oxygenated and returns back into the left atrium, if the patient has the communication, non-oxygenated blood can go into the left atrium, but anyways, is coming already mixed back from the lung into the left atrium and passes into the right atrium. So basically what happens is that since the left pressure, since the left side of the heart is the higher pressure system compared to the right, since always, always, always we have higher pressure at the level of the left atrium and left ventricle compared to the right side of the heart, whenever there is a communication either interatrial or intraventricular, the common sense is that right volumes don't pass to the left, but because the pressure system is higher in the left, already oxygenated blood coming from the lungs will be mixed with non-oxygenated present in the right atrium and right ventricle. And it doesn't really matter that they get mixed because anyways, whatever blood is present in the right atrium or right ventricle still goes back again into the lungs to be oxygenated. So these patients tend to be uh, uh, um, having less morbidity and mortality, less symptoms because of the advantage that since the left side of the heart is a high pressure system, oxygenated blood constantly is mixed with non-oxygenated, but still oxygenated blood goes into the tissue to perfuse the tissue, and whatever mixture we have in the right side anyways is gonna go to the lung to be re-oxygenated again. Um, this is basically a non-cyanotic congenital anomaly compared to, for example, uh, um, opposition of the great vessels or quartation of the aorta. Okay, so basically is what is happening here. Now, um, this is basically uh, an explanation of the S4, which we already have gone through. Remember that these are diastolic murmurs, S4 is always, always pathological. Basically, uh, it is the, before the first uh, heart sound and after S3. Uh, basically marks diastole. Most of the time, uh, S4 is due to a stiffness of the left ventricle, either by high pressure system due in aortic stenosis, for example, uh, or mitral stenosis. Um, it could be uh, present in patients that do have hypertension. So S3, most commonly in CHF, or physiological in volume overload states, such as pregnancy, elderly patients, pediatric patients, athletes. Uh, fourth house sound is always, always pathological. So think about disease process that can give you high pressure from hypertension or aortic stenosis, for example. Um, remember that always uh, 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 high pressure systems at the level of the atriums tend to produce a turbulency, so that it could complicate uh, with cardiac arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, reason for which these patients uh, must be on anticoagulant if atrial fibrillation is present. And remember that it's a low frequency uh, uh, sound, so it's best heard with a bell. High pitch with the diaphragm, 
Lopez with the bell. So let's go over the history. So basically, you have to not only do a good assessment, but also look at the risk factors that the patient have in order to correct those uh, to avoid uh, advancement of the disease. So what signs and symptoms would the patient have? Do they have uh, chest pain, uh, pressure-related, retrosternal? Sorry, retrosternal. Do you have weakness? Do you have fatigue on exertion? Do you uh, do you have any uh, um, um, uh, condition that impedes you to uh, lay flat on the bed that is highly indicative of volume overload state, uh, such as orthopnea? Are you sleeping through the night and suddenly you wake up uh, to be able to catch your breath, which is no more than paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea that is indicative of a patient having a volume overload state of uh, CHF? Do you have any type of hemoptysis? Sometimes hemoptysis is not only related to pulmonary conditions, we're gonna talk about in pulmonary uh, assessment, uh, could be an infectious process, an inflammatory process of the lung, or a high congestion due to high pressure and volume in the load, uh, in the, I'm sorry, in the lung, produ produced by pulmonary edema, which could be cardiogenic in nature, okay? Do you have any type of claudication? Do you have pain when you walk? that you have to stop to be able to uh, relieve your pain because you're releasing lactic acid. That's an indication of uh, arterial occlusion at the level of the lower extremities that is indicative for peripheral vascular disease because the patient most likely are a smoker or the patient has atherosclerosis. Do you have any type of lower extremity edema uh, that is speeding in nature that uh, can tell me that if you have any type of possibility of have, having right side heart failure. Look at the family history and the past medical history of the patient that can put this patient at risk for these conditions. You have a website here that you can practice uh, sounds. Um, now let's talk about palpitation. What is palpitation? Well, basically it's one of the most common symptoms of the patients that we sent that could be no more uh, uh, benign as having anxiety related condition, but palpitations could also come from thyroid disorder. So if the patient has, for example, hyperthyroidism, that can give you palpitation. But palpitation could also be the result of having high pressure systems. Uh, the catecholamine, the sympathetic nervous system trying to uh, overwork, uh, either because the patient has hypertension or because the patient is trying to autoregulate due to low volume, uh, not, not outside in the intertissue uh, produced by edema, but intravascularly. So any type of changes in volume and pressure can produce an autoregulatory response and the patients can have palpitation. Palpitation is a perception. The patient feels that the heart is racing, even if it's not projected as such in an EKG or in a telemetry monitor. Okay, so it's very uh, uh, concerning uh, for the patient and sometimes as I said it's completely physiological uh, but could also be a precipitant factor of uh, uh, cardiac dysrhythmias. So again it's sensory, it's, it's just a perception uh, even if sometimes the heart rate is completely normal, even if it's regular, uh, it's basically an unpleasant awareness that the patients have, uh, feeling that the heart is fluttering in the chest, feeling like a flip-flopping, a pounding sensation on the chest, even again, if objectively is not uh, um, uh, proved by an EKG. Uh, palpitations, again, look for tachyarrhythmias, look for hypotensive episode, look for uh, a disease process that increases pressure at the level of the heart, or a disease process that can give you a volume overload in the interstitium, but not intravascularly. And when the patients are volume depleted, uh, for example, due to right side of heart failure, patients can have, as an autoregulatory response, tachycardia and palpitation. Brevia arrhythmias, on the contrary, as I explained at the beginning, the heart rate is than 60 due to uh, parasympathetic response, or if the patient has any type of blockage at the level of the AV node, or at the level of the bundle branches, can also give you uh, brevia arrhythmias. Uh, this is present physiological in trained athletes, so uh, don't panic if the bradycardia is completely asymptomatic, and. Mostly when the patients look uh, uh, fit, 
um, is completely normal for them. So basically look for the symptoms. Do not treat any type of bradycardia unless the patients have symptoms or of course you see that the conduction is uh, compromised. Uh, it could be uh, present in patients that have a, uh, um, uh, advanced aged uh, or patients again as I said have any type of uh, AV conduction abnormalities or bundle branch blocks. Could be also medication so at least try to rule out the most common uh, possibilities because if the patient for example is in any type of beta blockers or calcium channel blocker, digoxin, that can produce the bradycardia. So try to discontinue the uh, insulting agents first before you start treating the bradycardia. Look for electrolyte imbalances such as hypokalemia, hypoglycemia, hypomagnesemia that alters the conduction uh, velocity and patients can have uh, bradycardia. It could be no more than any type of uh, cardiac arrhythmia. We're going to have, uh, and actually you have an independent module on uh, EKG, so uh, we're not going to go in detail uh, for the cardiac arrhythmias, but um, what can produce tabernacle cardia, for example, as I said, if the patients are in digoxin beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, patients that have any type of AB block or any type of bundle branch block, that can produce uh, Brady arrhythmias. Signs and symptoms that those are the ones that you have to treat because if impeding tissue perfusion, if the patient has any type of chest pain with the bradycardia, the patient has shortness of breath, if the patient has fatigue, if the patient has alteration of blood pressure, so if MAP is less than 65 or systolic blood pressure is compromised due to the bradycardia, uh, less than 90 is when you treat. Remember that elderly populations are very atypical presentation. You expect shortness of breath, but sometimes tissue hyperperfusion for them is represented as outer mental status. So basically what you're going to do to be able to uh, prove that the patients that do have any type of tachy or bradyarrhythmia arrhythmia is either the patient is attached to the monitor, you can see at a glance, Otherwise, you have to do a 12-week EKG to be able to prove uh, the fact. Uh, when uh, it's part of six months, uh, you could do a halter monitor. Please, again, look for the medications that the patients are taking and try to discontinue if it's possible. Uh, look at the electrolyte imbalances. As I said, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia. Look at the thyroid function. Patients with tachycardia, they tend to be hyperthyroid. Patients with bradycardia, they tend to be with hypothyroid. So look at the TSH and the T3 and T4 values. Bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias could also be indicative of acute coronary syndrome. So you have to do always an EKG and troponins level when you see that patients have tachy or bradyarrhythmias that are symptomatic, okay? Now, tachyarrhythmias, of course, is the uh, countries, the heart rate are more than 100. And again, could be completely asymptomatic. Physiological response of high catecholamines level are present in patients' pediatric population. So um, they are completely asymptomatic. Sometimes that uh, you are uh, having anxiety and you don't even have palpitation. And when they monitor your pulse, you are greater than 100. So Look for symptoms and treat accordingly. Uh, if the patient has any type of tissue hyperperfusion due to the tachyarrhythmia, either if it's sinus tachycardia, that could be represented as weakness, dizziness, shortness of breath, chest pain, syncope, if when you treat. And again, look for disease process that can give you tachycardia. For example, we talked about hyperthyroidism, which increases metabolic rate, and that includes the heart rate. Patients that have anemia, if you have decreased oxygen carrying capacity because the hemoglobin is low, the body is having hypoxemia. The body is smart. When it's trying to compensate for the tissue hyperperfusion, increases not only cardiac output, but also heart rate to be able to increase the stroke volume and, and tissue perfusion. So anemia could be an indicative uh, uh, disease process that gives you tachycardia. Hypoxemic state as respiratory diseases, any diseases, any major acute bleeding 
can also decrease the oxygen carry capacity and therefore can give you tachyarrhythmias. arrhythmias. Exercise, stress, patients that are, for example, in many vasoconstrictive drugs such as cocaine, uh, can give you tachycardia as well. But always try to rule out cardiovascular conditions or pulmonary conditions first before you say that this is anxiety. Look at electrolyte imbalances. So do a 12 lead CKG, do troponins, try to rule out possibility for pulmonary embolism if the patient is high risk. So this is basically um, um, tachyarrhythmias that we can have super, uh, uh, ventricular arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias as well. So for example, sinus tachycardia uh, is heart rate greater than 100, so the patients do have a P wave, they have a normal PR interval, the normal QRS, uh, which is narrow. Uh, patients uh, could have, for example, fever, pain, uh, anemias, or it could be, for example, hyperthyroidism, as we explained. Patients with supraventricular tachycardia still having a narrow QRS, and for the heart rate is greater than 150 actually. Uh, patients have exactly the same uh, etiology, uh, but of course because the tissue is, uh, perfusion is highly compromised, they tend to have more signs and symptoms of syncope, shortness of breath, and chest pain. Patients with ventricular tachycardia, this is the widening of the QRS with a fast heart rate as well. Uh, disease process that can give you ventricular arrhythmias Look for the ventricular wall, so having an MI, having, for example, uh, cardiomyopathy, valvulopathies. Atrial fibrillation is mo mostly, uh, as well as atrial flutter, is mostly at the level of the uh, atrium. We already went through two disease processes that can give you that. For example, tricuspid valvulopathies and mitral uh, valvulopathies. But electrolyte imbalances, hypoxia, uh, toxic drums uh, uh, can also give you that, as well as pulmonary embolism can give you atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, et cetera, okay? So now let's go to the actual um, uh, content that we have to discuss today, which is chest pain differential diagnosis. So basically chest pain is no more than uh, the discomfort, uh, the, the, the pressure like that the patient would have, depending on the anatomic location, we will determine the differential diagnosis. Uh, that could have or not uh, any type of radiation, we have to be able to differentiate between disease process that can give you chest pain. And this is the uh, purpose of this class today. So basically 39% of the population would have some type of chest pain at some point, even if it's benign, as such as musculoskeletal or GERD. 5% uh, of those patients, they tend to seek uh, emergency department. And 50% of them would have myocardial infarction truly, and 30 to 35 will only have angina pectoris. This is basically statistics. So the primary aim uh, that we try to do is to be able to differentiate between uh, all the uh, tissues or all the disease process that can give you chest pain and uh, either by clinical scenario as well as confirming this with diagnostic evaluation. So always talk to your patient to know first the quality of chest pain. Try to rule out first ischemic conditions because those are, gonna, are the ones that are gonna kill the patient first. And then you can determine if this could be just an anxiety related chest pain or this could be musculoskeletal or GERD. But the first, at least, Two, that you have to rule out are cardiovascular conditions and pulmonary conditions. So again, look at the quality, the location, the radiation. When did it start? For example, patients that have progressively worsening uh, chest pain on exertion that is relieved by rest, most likely is related to acute coronary syndrome, right? Versus if you were completely normal, and uh, either a rest, you have a chest pain sudden in nature. That doesn't mean that it could be heart related, but it could also be related to pulmonary embolism. But the, the quality of the pain is completely different. Uh, you would see that patients with acute cor uh, coronary syndrome, they would have mostly pressure-like pain compared to pulmonary embolism, which is sharp in nature. That uh, uh, cardiovascular conditions do not uh, uh, position or movement does not change the quality of the pain versus inspiration 
uh, uh, cough and uh, movement can also affect uh, pulmonary diseases. Movement as well affects patients that have musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at what precipitated the pain and the risk factors that the patients would have and what improved, what exacerbates, what alleviates. Uh, during the physical examination, of course, you have to look at the pulse of the patient. Uh, you have to take the blood pressure to see if at any point this chest pain is compromising the hemodynamic of the patient. You're going to do also as well a chest uh, uh, auscultation to see if it's primarily coming from the lung or if it's cardiovascular condition is already giving you complications at the level of the lung since they're both interconnected. Giving you, for example, uh, inspiratory crackles. If you have a patient with inspiratory crackles, that means that the patient is in volume overload state and most likely this patient has systolic heart failure or any valvulopathy at the left side of the heart and that's the reason for, sorry, for the chest pain. If on the contrary you have pleural rod, the chest pain of this patient most likely uh, uh, is due to pericarditis. So we're going to go through all that. Okay? If you have any type of murmur, uh, uh, most likely it's a valvulopathy that could be chronic in nature or just acute related to a rupture of the cord tendina. Or for example, if you're able to mimic the chest pain by uh, palpating on the area that the patient is complaining about, if you're able to reproduce the pain by palpation, most likely what this patient has is uh, musculoskeletal in nature. Okay, so now let's go over differential diagnosis of non-cardiac uh, chest pains, and as well as we're going to differentiate cardiac related. So. When a patient has chest pain, if you see the patient that is calm, that is breathing properly, that is not having any type of diaphoresis, that you don't see paleness on the patient, most likely this is not an acute condition that requires immediate attention such as a PE or uh, an acute coronary syndrome. Here is just no more than a statistics uh, representing how the pains are uh, manifesting when the patients have uh, myocardial infarction. Um, patients most likely, again, they do have chest pain, chest pain, pressure in nature, retrosternal radiation, most likely radiates to the left arm, but I have seen radiation as well, and it's described in the literature in the right arm as well. Uh, patients uh, can have both shoulders, highly prevalent, uh, highly associated with exertion because there's tissue uh, um, uh, oxygen demand and uh, the supply is really uh, limited due to the uh, occlusion of the uh, coronary artery. Um, associated with diaphoresis, uh, sometimes due to the uh, celiac plexus, uh, patients do have nausea and vomiting and also uh, activation of the parasympathetic system uh, patients do have uh, nausea and vomiting as well. Patients that also uh, tend to describe it as fresh, uh, pressure in nature as compared as a typical presentation. Sometimes the patients uh, feel bloating, sometimes they have an epigastric pain, sometimes um, they don't have any pain whatsoever. For example, when patients have diabetes, that they tend to have neuropathy and uh, sometimes the uh, myocardial infarction is uh, discovered as an incidental finding. So basically there's many variabilities uh, uh, with the presentation of acute coronary syndrome, okay? So um, EKG wise, I want you to remember that when a patient has ST elevation, uh, these patients, they tend to have um, an injury. Uh, uh, basically it's a myocardial infarction. When the patients have ST depression, uh, the patients have ischemia. And this could be a non-systemic elevation myocardial infarction, or it could be just an acute coronary syndrome related to angina pectori, stable or unstable. So look at the EKG as well. It could be a completely normal EKG and having the signs and symptoms of an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, now, the major difference between angina and myocardial infarction, remember, is the troponins. In angina, there's no troponin elevation. There's no leakage because there's no damage to the myocardium, only ischemia, and in myocardial infarction, there is troponins uh, being elevated, okay? 
So basically, as you could see, this is a normal EKG. So when you have high peak T waves, uh, that could be a representation as well of myocardial infarction. Uh, patients have ST elevation and elevation of the J point. Um, and as well, they tend to have a, a Q wave formation, which is a sign of necrosis, T wave inversion. Um, those are signs of uh, acute coronary syndrome related to ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now, non cardiac related chest pain, let's look first about pleuritic in nature. So, pleurisy. What can give you irritation of the pleura? and therefore the patients do have chest pain that mimics myocardial infarction. First of all, the chest pain that is pleuritic in nature, with the pleura, uh, is tend to be sharp because the pleura surrounds the lung when the patients take a deep breath hurts, when the patients cough hurts, um, and anything that irritates the pleura can give you pleuritis uh, or pleurisy, so from pneumonia, pleuritis itself by either abscesses or pneumothorax or pleural effusions or uh, PE. This is the one that we have to rule out the most um, when we have uh, pleurisy, even though, of course, pneumonia can give you that. Now, other disease process that can irritate um, the brachial nerve and uh, produce uh, uh, irritation of the diaphragm and therefore uh, chest pain as well, uh, GERD, very, very highly common. Uh, patients uh, tend to complain about retrosternal uh, chest pain, but it's most likely burning in nature, associated or not with some type of reflux. Any gastrointestinal disease can give you this type of uh, pain. For example, patients with pancreatitis, uh, since myocardial infarction could be present with an epigastric type of pain, patients with pancreatitis, they tend to complain about epigastric pain, that is dull sometimes, sometimes it's sharp, it tends to radiate to the back, uh, to the right shoulder, uh, and it's highly confused with uh, chest pain as well. Uh, patients with uh, gallbladder disease, uh, they also tend to have epigastric chest pain that radiates to the right upper quadrant that could be associated with nausea and vomiting, and uh, later phases uh, of the disease jaundice. Okay, now let's talk about muscular skeletal disease. Most likely this patient has a history of either moving, uh, 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 lifting high uh, uh, weight uh, or, or any type of furniture or doing any type of exercise or any type of sport related activity. Look for that particular uh, history that the patients tend to forget to be able to correlate this chest pain with uh, any type of costochondritis uh, or muscular skeletal related that is mimic when you press and sometimes when the patients move also exacerbates. Highly prevalent in pregnant women because progesterone tends to uh, uh, expand the joints so the costal uh, um, uh, sternal angles and the vertebral angles as well tends to be stretched and that hurts a lot joints at the level of the hip, but we're not talking from the waist down. If it happens at the level of the chest wall and the sternum, can also produce that chest pain that is highly reproducible, and when the patients move, that hurts as well the most. Okay, I'm not saying that you're not gonna work out the patient for cardiovascular conditions, but that's something that you need to have in mind. Another disease process that can give you highly uh, severe chest pain, for example, if you have a type of intercostal herpes zoster, uh, patients also tend to have retrosternal chest pain that tends to radiate to the side, but unfortunately in the initial phases of the disease, you don't see the vesicular rash. Otherwise, it would be very easy to uh, um, rule out. Uh, patients, for example, that have splenic infarct tend to have uh, chest pain, in the, I'm sorry, the epigastrium that radiates to the left side of the heart worsening inspiration as well. Uh, but of course, most likely this patient, for example, has a history of sickle cell disease, or the patient is in high spore activity, or the patient, for example, uh, had a, a mononucleosis and uh, a motor vehicle accident. That could be uh, a history of presentation. Another one that is diagnosis of exclusion that you never think until you have ruled out the acute diseases that are life-threatening is a panic attack. 
cardiac uh, related, uh, let's talk about uh, some examples uh, that can give you chest pain. For example, patients with aortic dissection, they tend to have as well retrosternal type of chest pain. It's ripening, it's tearing, it's severe in nature, radiates to the back, and it's associated with hemodynamic instability. Patient with pulmonary embolism, as well as pulmonary hypertension, as previously stated, is a pleuritic type of chest pain, tends to be sharp, worse in the inspiration and cough. If we talk about pericarditis, it's also sharp. Why? Because the pleura is a serosa and the pericardium is a serosa, so they have the same exact uh, quality of pain. But in pericarditis, when the patients lean back, it hurts a lot, and when the patients lean forward, alleviates, and it's also associated with widespread uh, of ST elevation in the EKG, even though there's several patterns uh, present, but the patients also tend to have pericardial friction rub, sometimes associated with pericardial effusion that can be seen in an X-ray or in an echocardiogram. Uh, patients with cocaine abuse, this is a very potent vasoconstrictor that produces a temporary uh, ischemia of the coronary vessels producing uh, chest pain. Uh, the acute coronary syndrome that we are actually uh, concentrating on is the angina versus myocardial infarction. Remember that angina, there's a classification of stable angina and unstable angina. Stable angina is no more than the chest pain, pressure, retrosternal, radiated to the neck, to the, to the jaw, to the uh, left shoulder or right shoulder and interscapular area that is worsening with exertion and is elevated by rest or by nitroglycerin. Unstable angina, in the past, we used to classify as, this is the opposite of stable angina, not anymore. One of the criteria is such, but another criteria, any new onset of chest pain, ischemic in nature, has to be treated as unstable angina as well as if the patient is having stable angina and now the quality of the pain, the um, frequency of the pain, and what have alleviated this chest pain before does not, this changes in pattern or quality uh, is also classified as unstable angina. Now, um, cardiogenic shock is no more than patient having a myocardial infarction or therefore has impeded cardiac output, patient is hemodynamically unstable. That requires uh, inotropic support and sometimes balloon pump or uh, left ventricular assistive device up to the point of uh, transplant. So this is basically what I have just discussed about disease process that can give you chest pain and anatomic location and how do they hurt. Uh, basically, again, look at the most common symptoms that you have to rule out. So look at cardiovascular conditions and pulmonary conditions that can kill the patient first. Before you can say that it's GERD, before you can say that this is related to panic attack. So in the differential diagnosis, again, any type of acute chest pain can be produced by Cardiovascular condition, pulmonary conditions, gastrointestinal conditions, yes. But look at what has precipitated this chest pain, what alleviates, what exacerbates, uh, what are the prior history, what were you doing before uh, you developed this uh, chest pain. We went through all the disease process that can give you that. For example, we uh, did not discuss lung cancer, but any disease process that can damage the pleura, or the pericardium can also produce chest pain. And look at the statistic frequency of it. We tend to miss uh, uh, gastrointestinal uh, diseases, uh, mostly uh, GERD, um, because again, it's not wrong practice that we ruled out any type of myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome first before we think about gastroesophageal reflux disease. But as you can see, uh, we are treating are wasting more and more resources when the patients, uh, due to a high quality history, can be diagnosed with gastroesophageal reflux disease outpatient and prevent uh, ER visits. Um, so again, whenever you receive a patient with chest pain, 
in the hospital, you have to rule out acute coronary syndrome, and it is until proven otherwise. So you have to receive the patient, do a 12 lead CKG, run troponins. If the troponins are elevated, you have to coordinate if you are in a facility that is cardiac cath uh, um, uh, uh, available, uh, then you have to uh, bring the patient for uh, percutaneous per per coronary uh, intervention with or without stent placement, okay? Uh, if this is not available and you are in a facility that uh, this is not highly uh, uh, pre uh, prevalent, if the patient is a candidate for thrombolysis, you give thrombolysis if the patient has an ST elevation myocardial infarction, and then you uh, uh, try to transfer the patient into a facility that is uh, capable for uh, percutaneous coronary intervention. If on the country, the patient is a non systemic elevation myocardial infarction, you run the uh, protocol routine, which is no more than you give a patient aspirin, uh, dual antiplatelet, actually aspirin and Plavix or Berlinta, if it's not contraindicated, um, you uh, have to give the patient nitroglycerin sublingual, uh, PRN for chest pain. If the patient is having acutely chest pain, the patient must be on nitroglycerin drip unless it's hemodynamically unstable that impedes uh, 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 nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin to be started. Morphine uh, not only relieves pain, but also decreases preload and afterload. So that is highly indicative for patients that have uh, any type of myocardial infarction. Uh, patients also should be on heparin drip uh, until uh, um, at least 24 hours until uh, seen by a cardiologist to uh, try to bring this patient to cardiac cath and uh, uh, do or not a percutaneous coronary, inter coronary intervention. So again, uh, ST systemic elevation myocardial infarction, the protocol is uh, cardiac cath availability, if you are in that facility, bring the patient as soon as possible into a uh, procedure to do PCI with or without stem placement. And the same protocol for the non stemmy you have to put the patient on aspirin, uh, Plavix or Berlinta, which is dual antiplatelet therapy. You have to give nitroglycerin, a heparin drip, and you have to put the patient on high dose statin. Okay? So, whenever you suspect, um, that the patient has myocardial infarction. Uh, again, look at the precipitating factor, the elevating factor, uh, look at the associated symptoms. Uh, sometimes the, uh, they do have only chest pain, sometimes they have associated shortness of breath due to the ischemia. Uh, sometimes they do come with fever, uh, even though it is not highly prevalent. Um, any similar symptoms that you have experienced before? So look at the past medical history of the patient because if the patient has felt the same pain and the patient has a history of myocardial infarction in the past or coronary artery bypass in the past, they will be able to describe that it's exactly the same pain that they have had before. Uh, look at the health habits of the patient. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, patients having high cholesterolemia, patient smoker, patient that are using drug abuse. For example, the history is trauma, most likely you would think about musculoskeletal condition. Look at the family history. Does anybody on the primary family has died at an early age less than 50 due to acute coronary syndrome? Look at the overall appearance of the patient, and most commonly, most I'm sorry, most prevalent is for you to look at the vital signs to see if this myocardial infarction or angina is producing any type of hemodynamic instability. So basically, going through our comparisons uh, that we have kind of like uh, uh, gone through uh, uh, briefly, myocardial infarction is mostly retrosternal, it's mostly pressure squeezing, heaviness, even though it could be described by some patients as burning, burning is most commonly present in gastroesophageal reflux disease. That most of the time radiates to the jaw, to the neck, to the left or the right shoulder, uh, that is worse on exertion, uh, that is actually more uh, prevalent at 30 minutes or more compared to angina, which is less than 30 minutes, uh, that is only relieved by rest or only relieved by nitroglycerin, which is also a pattern of unstable angina, but unstable angina has no cardiac troponin release and 
my, and I do have troponin release. Remember that women and diabetic patients tend to have an atypical presentation. Sometimes it's an epigastric, uh, sometimes it's digi related type of uh, symptomatology uh, because of uh, neuro neuropathies that patients with uh, diabetes, for example, tend to have. Okay, look to see if there's any major complications associated with uh, myocardial infarction. If the patient has a flash pulmonary edema, if there's an S4 and S3 present, if there's any murmur that has precipitated that, for example, due to acute rupture of the papillary muscle. Angina is exactly the same uh, type of pain, but less duration. Uh, patients do not release troponin. Remember that stable angina is relieved by rest and nitroglycerin. And unstable angina is that new onset or change of pattern or that pain that does not relieve by rest or nitroglycerin. Uh, epidemiological uh, uh, way, uh, remember that we basically uh, see more cases of women that, I'm sorry, the men than women. Uh, basically, uh, patients could even present uh, uh, less than 30 years of age, but more commonly are in uh, middle adulthood. Um, and uh, after 50 years of age, we have basically the same equivalence after the patients go through uh, menopause. Uh, highly mortality in uh, patients that are elderly and African Americans uh, compared to ca Caucasians and uh, non-Hispanic. So basically, as I told you, uh, less than 30 minutes uh, duration is angina, either unstable or stable. Uh, even though it could be pressure tight in nature, squeezing the same as myocardial infarction, sometimes it's described by some patients, even though it's minimal, a uh, rare presentation, it could be sharp in nature. But try to look at and try to think about mostly sharp, uh, pleuritic type of pain or pericarditis type of pain. As I told you, some patients do present with epigastric distress or they basically say, you know, I ate and the food, uh, um, I didn't take it properly, so maybe I'm having uh, uh, a GI distress and basically what they're having is an inferior wall in my uh, the radiation that again is typical is the neck, uh, jaw, to the uh, left or right shoulder or bilateral shoulder, even though sometimes there is no radiation uh, whatsoever. That again, precipitated factors is mostly on exertion. Uh, if you have any type of uh, bad or good news, uh, so during emotions, uh, heavy meals, exposure to weather changes. If a patient has any type of infectious process, that can trigger. Uh, uh, myocardial infarction, any type of uh, tissue hyperperfusion, for example, if the patient has any type of se severe anemia, uh, if the patient has any type of pulmonary condition that produces hypoxia, that can exacerbate cardiovascular condition. So any tissue hyperperfusion state can trigger myocardial ischemia and therefore, I'm sorry, infarction. So look at uh, if it's relieved by rest and nitroglycerin, most likely it's angina. Most likely you will not see uh, troponins being elevated. Remember that S4 is high pressure uh, diastolic uh, sound that most commonly is present, for example, in patients that have any type of stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or, for example, in mitral regurg. Remember that S3 could be completely normal, but S4 is always pathological. Remember that on stable angina, as I told you, uh, in the past, it used to be only the uh, uh, chest pain that is on exertion, that is not relieved by rest, not relieved by nitroglycerin, but now a new onset of angina is unstable and it has to be treated as such, uh, and also a change in pattern is unstable angina. That is also associated with the same manifestations as myocardial infarction, chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, and nausea as well. So pericarditis, uh, pericarditis is no more than an inflammatory process of the pericardium that most commonly is inflammatory in nature, but that could also be infectious, that could also be due to uremic accumulations so or urea accumulation and also can be related to autoimmune conditions. So, for example, as I said, etiological wise could be, for example, parasitic, fungal infection, viral infection, 
autoimmune conditions, either patients that have renal failure and they release high levels of urea. So basically what you have to do first is to, since they have exactly the same signs and symptoms, even though this one is more sharp in nature, retrosternal, worsening inspiration and cough. Sometimes when the patients lay down, it hurts the most. When the patients lean forward, uh, it alleviates. Uh, basically what happens is that patients uh, could or not release uh, troponins, uh, but the patients do have elevation of inflammatory markers, which are cell rate is elevated, CRP is elevated. They tend to have leukocytosis, which is not commonly present in myocardial infarction. What happens in uh, this patient, regardless of the etiology, uh, the uh, pericardium has two layers, the parietal and the visceral layer. So the amount of fluid that is present and is supposed to avoid friction uh, leaks out. So the patients uh, tend to have pericardial friction rub, which is a highly pathognomonic sign for these patients. These patients hurt the most, as I said, when they lay down, uh, alleviates when the patients lean forward, is worse in inspiration, is worse uh, during cough. Okay, so um, you again, you tend to hear uh, pericardial friction rub uh, to be biphasic or triphasic, meaning in inspiration and expiration, and in the entire cardiac cycle when it's severe. So what will you see on the uh, EKG? Well, you see a widespread elevation of the ST segment, and also you could also leak out cardiac troponin. So, but the major difference in pericarditis is that. It might have a complete clean cardiac cath. Uh, when you do an echocardiogram, you see severe um, uh, uh, inflammatory uh, all around the pericardium. And also, in the EKG, it's impossible that you would have a myocardial infarction in all the walls of the heart. So this widespread elevation of the ST segment is highly prevalent in patients that have uh, pericarditis, okay? These patients can have complications from constricted pericarditis associated with autoimmune conditions that you would understand better, musculoskeletal, and also another complication is pericardial effusion up to the point of cardiac tamponade restricting diastolic function preload and therefore cardiac output. So as I said, it's sharp in nature, it's retrosternal, uh, tends to radiate also to the left shoulder, uh, it's worse with, with inspiration, it's worse with cough, it's worse when the patients lay down, it's better when the patients lean forward. They have a pathognomonic sign of pericardial friction rub due to the uh, absence of the fluid between both uh, 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 pericardial layers. 